This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Here's a function that is zero everywhere except between negative a and a. In that region, the y value is a constant 1 over 2a. So this is just a rectangle with an area of 1. As we let a approach 0, the rectangle becomes skinnier and taller, but the area under the curve remains the same. As a gets infinitely small, the function essentially becomes a single spike with infinite height and no width. And this here is known as the Dirac delta function, written lowercase delta of t. It's zero everywhere except at t equals zero, where it's infinity. And although infinitely skinny, it has an area of one. Now, if this were a graph of force versus time, what would that look like, an infinite force for a single moment? Well, the technical definition is this would be like if the Flash was able to wield Thor's hammer and struck something as hard as possible for as short a duration as possible, keeping the area under that curve 1. So like a billion newtons of force over a billionth of a second, or a trillion newtons of force over a trillionth of a second. That is basically the Dirac delta function. And this kind of function actually does come up in the real world. Maybe not to the degree of infinite force, but hitting a golf ball or a lightning strike. These deliver very high forces or voltages over a very short time period, which we can model with the Dirac delta function. So what would the result be if we hit a block with this force, and why do we care? Well, if you've taken a physics class, you know that the area under the force versus time graph equals the change in momentum of a system. If the flash wielding Thor's hammer is the only thing applying the force, then we just need to find the area under the curve of the Dirac delta function, which is one. If the block has a mass of one kilogram and starts at rest, then the delta V and final velocity will be one meter per second. But this change in velocity happens in a single moment. T1 and T2 are both zero really. So when that force is applied, what we'd see is the block immediately jump from rest to one meter per second. And if there's no friction, it will just coast from there. So really the Dirac delta function kicks the system into gear, kind of giving it a new initial condition. And one meter per second is not that fast, so it might not seem fair to model the force on a golf ball with this function, since those are kicked to a velocity of maybe 75 meters per second. But all we have to do is multiply the function by 75. And there we go. This function pretty much models the actual force delivered by a golf club. Okay, so now why do we care? Well, it's actually not because we need a way to model these situations with high force over a short time period. That's not what you focus on at all when you learn about this. The reason this function is important is because by knowing what the system does when the Dirac delta function is applied, and this output is known as the impulse response, by knowing that you can figure out what the system will do when any other function is applied. We only need to know h of t and the input to get this response. And here's how. Let's say our superhero applies the Dirac delta function to a one kilogram mass on a spring where air resistance is accounted for. We'd see the same thing as before. The velocity would jump to one meter per second, and then after that, the resulting equation of motion, the impulse response h of t, will look like this. So with that, now we can determine what will happen if we restart and apply any other force. Let's say that force is one half e to the minus t, and our initial conditions are back to rest. Notice I'm defining these functions as zero before t equals zero, which makes this easier to see, but also is more real world, since things usually aren't on forever. An applied force typically starts at some time t equals zero. Now to find the output, what we do is first reflect the impulse response over the y-axis, and then we're gonna slide it to the right. Mathematically, this is written as h of some constant a minus t, where a is currently zero. If we let a go to one, then we'd get this here. Then what we do is multiply these two functions together, giving us the curve in blue. And it's the area under this curve 
that tells us the output at time A. So right now, the area under the curve is about 0 0.052, which means at time equals one second, the block will be at the position x equals 0 0.052. At time equals three seconds, the area and thus position will be x equals 0 0.031 meters. So if we actually plot that area as a function, it would look like this. Jeez, there's a lot of graphs here. Like this y value at t equals 3 for the curve in white is 0 0.03113, the area under the blue curve for this current shift. If we keep plotting those outputs, those areas for all values of a, we get an entire curve, which is the output. This is what our system does when it's given an input of one half e to the minus t. And that's everything. But notice that we don't really know anything about the system. I told you the block has a mass of one kilogram, but we don't know the spring constant, we don't know the coefficient of friction, and we didn't need to know them. That's the power of the impulse response. In theory, I can walk up to any linear time invariant system at rest and strike it with a hammer or lightning and just look at what it does. Then slide that against any new input I want and I can get the output. You don't need to determine mass, resistance, coefficient of anything. All that info is kind of built into the impulse response. This is known as convolution, and the equation for it looks like this, which is what we just did. It says take the area under the curve of one function times another that is flipped and shifted. When g of t is the impulse response, which is typically written h of t, this is the output to a system for some input f of t. But wait, there's a little more, because the Dirac delta function comes up in sneaky ways sometimes. As I said, often in engineering, you think of inputs to systems as turning on. Flipping a switch that turns on a circuit might look like this, where it immediately goes from 0 volts to 1 volt in this case. This is known as the step function u of t. And the derivative, the slope of this function, well, is zero everywhere except the origin, where we briefly get infinite slope. And hey, that's the Dirac delta function. That's u prime of t. So, as a final example, if you have an RC circuit, where R and C are one, and you flip on a one volt battery, the capacitor voltage response would be one minus e to the minus t times u of t. Multiplying by u of t just means y is zero for all negative values of t. Otherwise, you're multiplying by one. But this equation is something you'd pretty much see in a basic circuits class. What if the voltage is much more complicated? Well, if inputting u of t gives us this, then inputting the derivative or the Dirac delta function would give us this. That's the beauty of these types of systems. By taking the derivative on the input side, you just take the derivative on the output side and you get your answer. And this here is the unit impulse response, which again, we can use to find the response to any input to our system. So we can take something we've learned in a basic circuits class, which doesn't require too much advanced math, and use it to solve a problem that would require some more advanced math, like differential equations or the Laplace transform. And this is done through the power of the Dirac delta function and the unit impulse response. And even with everything discussed in this video, I know you're eager to learn some more math. And the good news is you can do so at Brilliant, the sponsor of this video. Brilliant is where you learn by doing with thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and AI. This platform has a first principles approach that helps you build an understanding from the ground up. And what I enjoy most about Brilliant is their animations and interactive exercises to help you gain that foundational knowledge of even the more complex topics, not through memorization, but through critical thinking skills and problem solving to help you become a better thinker. And Brilliant offers a wide range of courses guaranteed to teach you something new regardless of education level. Even when I go through some of their courses that I already took in college, 
I always find a new application or topic that I had never learned in school. So to try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash Zach Starr. You can also scan the QR code on screen or click the link in the description. With that, going to end that video there. Thanks as always to my supporters on Patreon. Social media links to follow me are down below, and I'll see you all in the next video.